my clock. It is one o'clock um, Brussels time. And uh, I see that we have uh, about 45 participants. So that's a, a good start going up as I speak. Um, so welcome to our third Thursday science webinar series, uh, where we showcase the science behind the, uh, the European Marine Board's publications. I am your moderator for today. My name is Sheila Heymans, and I'm the executive director of the uh, Marine Board. If you want to tweet about uh, or, or follow us, please do so on Twitter, and you can tweet with the hashtag Third Thursday Science. So today, if I can change my slides. Ah, there we go. Today, we're going to have an hour of entertainment on modeling, but first, let's look at the housekeeping rules. First, if you um, sign in, please make sure that your name is clearly entered so that when you ask a question, we know who you are. Um, if you ask questions, please use the question and answer, um, which you should see at the bottom of your screen uh, to do so. Um, please use the chat only for any technical support um, that we, uh, you know, we will see and, and please make sure that you only make it visible to the host. Um, so for questions and answers, please make sure that you know, uh, you let us know who you are and where you're from. It'd be nice to know what organization and country you're from. Um, and then I will basically, once the talk is done, I will um, sort of moderate the questions and find the questions that I think are the most relevant and ask those, speak those out to, um, to our speaker. So uh, also please, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded. Um, and it will be available on our website, which the link is there, and on our YouTube channel, so um, people could watch it again afterwards. Um, so, about today. So today we're basically focusing on the science behind our um, future science brief number four, which came out in October 2018. Um, and this uh, science brief was on enhancing Europe's capability and marine ecosystem modeling for societal benefit. Um, the talk will be on disclosing the truth. Um, are models better than observations? It's a, a quite a controversial title. And the author is, uh, is Morten um, Skohan. He, is actually, he was actually the chair of the working group that created uh, the document um, that, that, I, that was there and which you can download from the website. Um, so just quickly giving you an overview of uh, the, the document. It was launched in 2018, as I said, and the outcomes from this um, uh, Future Science Brief were actually presented at various meetings, including some ICES meetings, a SCARFISH meeting, which, which is an EU uh, meeting on fisheries. It's all, we've also represent, uh, presented it at the Joint Research Centre Center in ISPRA um, and at some modelling for policy meetings in Brussels. So it's actually had quite a lot of uptake in, in the policy sphere. Um, and also, uh, I was uh, asked because of this document to be co-author on a book chapter um, on um, ecosystem-based management, ecosystem services, and aquatic biodiversity theory, tools, and applications. Um, there was also a first seminar on this on this background document, uh, which happened in August uh, last year. So you can watch it on our YouTube channel if you're interested in some of the other sciences behind this document. So, but enough about, about that. Let's talk about the speaker today. Morten uh, Skogen is a senior scientist at the Institute for Marine Research in Bergen. Um, and he was the chair of the working group on ecosystem modeling. And he is going to give um, this talk, which is based on an opinion paper that was published in Marine Ecology Progress Series. So um, I think that's it from me. Um, I've, if I can ask Morten to put his video on. And then I will stop sharing and he can stay, share his um, slides, if you can, Morton. That would be great. See what I can do. Uh, chat one. Perfect. Did that help? Uh, yeah. And you, yeah, but you just need to make it full screen. We're still yeah. seeing your slides. Yeah. So... Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. And over to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sheila. I think I can add a little bit on my background. I've been working more than 25 years uh, with ecosystem modeling uh, at IMR. Uh, but by training, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a mathematician and I have a PhD in parallel computing. So, yeah, I will talk a little bit on ecosystem models, but from the title, you will see that the main focus will be on the rela relationship between models and observations. 
and how to best take advantage of models to better understand marine ecosystems, thus being a tool to disclose the truth. As Sheila said, uh, the presentation I will give is based on an article that is in press in Marine Ecology Progress Series. And the idea of the paper originated from discussions in an ISIS working group, WG IPEM. And there are, as you see from the list, a number of co-authors cool that I should acknowledge for their contribution to the paper. Uh, however, I should also say that they have not approved the content of this talk. So if you want to shoot the piano player, you should target on me. Okay, the presentation is naturally divided into three parts. It's truth, it's models, and it's observations. And uh, I will talk a little bit on that before I will give some examples on how models can be used to better disclose the truth before I try to round up it all by giving you some take home messages. <clears throat> okay, uh, as, a as a mathematician, truth for me is very simple. I mean, given a few axioms, everything else can be proven. So therefore truth is indisputable. Uh, in other sciences, truth is not that simple, at least not for me. Uh, I mean, what is truth in economy or in social sciences? It's not really obvious all the time. Uh, in geophysics, we have what we call the primitive equations, which basically is Newton's second law. You know that with force equals mass times acceleration. And that is why we have numerical weather forecasts. And that is also why ocean circulation is predictable. Unfortunately, there are no primitive equations in biology. So even if we can do predictions, and we do, the marine ecosystems are not predictable in the same way as for the physics. So what is truth in marine science then? Normally, we will build our own truth from what we observe using our senses. Uh, the challenge is, is that the information we get from what we observe is only part of the truth. And how to generalize from that sparse information? How do we build the knowledge from it? And how do we interpret the truth behind the observations? And when we are there, finally, how do we have sufficient wisdom to put the pieces together in the right way and find the causes to explain what we sense? Truth and thereby what is fake has been widely disputed over the last couple of years. And unfortunately, there has been a sundown on truth for a period. Uh, it's sad to see how knowledge-based science has been challenged by ignorance and denial lately. But fortunately, truth is not decided by majority decisions. But how relevant is fake news for marine science? How do we decide on truth? I mean, the oceans are big and most of it has never been observed. And it's said that we probably know more about the dark side of the moon than we do of our own oceans. Uh, and despite the growing number of observation activities, ocean oceanic observations are still scarce in time and space. So how do we decide on truth from the limited observation and information gained from what we observe? I guess most of you are familiar with Plato's allegory of the cave. Uh, in the allegory, the philosopher Socrates describes a group of people who have lived chained to the wall of a cave all their lives, facing a blank wall. These people watch shadows projected on a wall from objects, objects passing in front of a fire behind them, and they give name to these shadows. The shadows are the prisoner's reality, but are not accurate representations of the real world. Socrates explains how the philosopher is like a prisoner who is freed from the cave and comes to understand that the shadows on the wall are not reality at all. And 
This is a good analog to the observational sciences of today. Based on observed snapshots of a presumed reality, we try to explain what truth is like. And with this in mind, we should first try to explain what the model is. In science, a model is a simplified representation of an idea, an object, a process, or a system that is used to describe and explain a phenomenon. Uh, and models are very central to what scientists do, both in research and when com communicating explanations or results. Uh, a scientific model is also a way to systematically arrange and utilize the information from observations. And thereby, one can draw a conclusion and gain mechanistic understanding that would be difficult to achieve without the model. Models are diverse, and in this presentation, I will focus on so-called me mechanistic marine ecosystem models, or MMEMs. These are usually spatially resolved simulation models that aim to replicate a real marine ecosystem, and they use some sort of a numerical time stepping. So they will move in time. In science, we also distinguish between theoretical and predictive models. And MMEM should be both. They should be based on a sound theory, enhance our process understanding, and, and ideally be able to predict the dynamics of a model ecosystem. Some authors claim that models should be as simple as possible, while others will argue for mechanistically rich models that are less subject to error propagation than simple models, where mechanisms often will be aggregated into variables that are difficult to relate to the observations we have. In addition, mechanistically rich models are often necessary to test between alternative hypotheses. Uh, all MMEMs are what we also call in silico observations in a virtual space. And dependent on the model structure, it's also possible to generate data on variables that are hard or impossible to observe in the real space, for, for instance, rates. Furthermore, models are the only two that can be used to study the sensitivity and variability of state variables in so-called what-if scenarios. And as such, these models provide great support to management beyond observations. So that's what models are like. But what is an observation then? Uh, an observation is a piece of information from a natural system either received through our senses, that could be that we count whales, or, that, or we, that we are recording using a scientific instrument like a CTD or a troll. Uh, in marine science, observations and data are often misleadingly used as synonyms. So data are observations and the opposite. But data could be any piece of information, for instance, also model outputs. And in most cases, a scientific in the scientific instrument does not directly measure the quantity of interest, but something that has been shown to be directly related to it. For instance, fluorescence and for chlorophyll. Observations might also be models in themselves, where the measured quantity is a result from either empirically or semi-analytically derived algorithms, such as, for example, suspended particular matter from optical or acoustic sensor, or chlorophyll from remote sensing. One should also be aware that sampling site timing, frequency, and depth are generally defined by budgetary, logistically, and scientific needs. And as such, they already constitute the observational setups conditions and therefore will impact outcome of the sampling. Finally, one can argue that as observations only are discrete pieces of information in space and time, the process of putting them together to describe and explain a phenomenon or a system is also a model. But this time, a model that is based on the interpretation of all information available for the observer. A scientist 
is using the available observations to represent a process or a system that cannot be experienced directly, thus forming a conceptual model before reporting the findings. Therefore, we can say that observations and the interpretation together form a model. And as scientists belong to different schools, their interpretation of, of observational evidence represents a large variety in models that are hard to verify. To summarize, models are in silico observations with high spatial and temporal resolution in a virtual space, while in situ observations are scarce, scarce pieces of information in real space and time. Both models and observations are data that are projections of the truth. They, they do not alone represent the true idea of truth. They do not necessarily agree, but when combined, we can hope to get closer to the truth. Before I continue, I would like to say a few words on model validation, which is an essential and never ending story that should go hand in hand with model use and development. There are many definitions of model validation. I normally use one from D back in 1995, who says that validation of a computational model is the process of formulating and substantiating explicit claims about the applicability and accuracy of computational results with reference to the intended purpose of the model, as well as the natural system it represents. We note that validation depends on the purpose of the model. The definition say nothing about the absolute, ac absolute accuracy, and neither does it say anything about observations. The validation process is only said to encompass a wide range of activities aimed to providing the kind of informed re information required to make a computational result meaningful for the user. It's a classical misconception that observations are truth. And therefore, model validation, unfortunately, has evolved to only be the exercise of showing the agreement or disagreement between models and observations. However, as models and observations are different realizations of the truth and are operating on different spatial and temporal scales, such a comparison does not necessarily make any sense. This can be illustrated with this figure from a paper by Lynch et al. in 2009. It basically says that if models and observations agree, the misfit is zero, but still we can conclude that the true error is zero. By intuition, this might sound confusing because Observations are truth, isn't that? If you put your gear into the sea and get 30 fishes, they are there, and their weight and number are unquestionable. That is the truth, no question. Of course, your data are true, but real truth also depends on the question. And the question was probably not how many fishes you caught, but how many fishes there are or was in the sea. So, what the, do these 30 fish then represent? What is the catchability? What is the avoidance? Where are these fishes under their way to somewhere else? So 10 minutes later, you would have no fish in your trawl. And how many fish are there one nautic mile to the west? So the correctness and position of the, these 30 fishes is not to be questioned. But what about representativeness? and possibly bias when the number 30 is reported back to a database to be used in stock assessment. Observations give an incomplete access to natural phenomena and spatial and temporal resolution is a compromise. Models on the other hand, include a basic spatial and temporal resolution but offer an incomplete representation of processes and components of the natural system. Therefore, despite high precision 
observations might lose what is important, like the water lily. While models lack the representation to distinguish, to distinguish it from other flowers, thus it might be hard to recognize it. The big question is, of course, how to combine these different data sources to disclose truth. There is, of course, no simple answer to this. <clears throat> the answer will depend on the question and the quality of all available data sources. I will show a few examples where models are used to complement observations. There are, of course, thousands of such examples available in the literature, but I'm only giving 30 minutes. And these are not necessarily the best ones either, but can hopefully il illustrate some of my points. The first example is that uh, models can project into the future and tell about the past. As observations are limited to events that have already taken place, and a missed opportunity in time to observe something will never come back, hindcast modeling provides an excellent piece of, of the puzzle to fill the gaps in observations to better understand both the past and the present. MMEMs are probably also the best tool to project into the future and thereby, for example, better understand the consequences of management actions or climate change. As said before, predictability in biological systems are limited and some authors will even say that it does not exist. Those projections should be done with care. However, in many cases, models are the only source of information to help make decisions for the future. This example of a future projection is from a work back in 2014, where an ensemble of four different ecosystem models were used to project the eutrophication status towards the end of the century. Using three of the criteria from the OSPAR common procedure to assess the eutrophication status. Without going into details, the models project that in the Baltic Sea, most of the potential problem areas will become problem areas, while in the North Sea, the situation will not change that much. Ecosystem models can also estimate what is hard or even impossible to measure. Uh, monitoring programs are often focused on measuring concentrations that could be nutrients or, or plankton biomass, rather than food web fluxes, which is easily quantified using models. The only rate that is routinely measured is probably primary production. But even that comes with a high degree of uncertainty and with a, with a, with a large variability in space and time, annual production in an ocean area can't be quantified from in situ observations alone. Models are also an efficient way. Uh, sorry, models are also an efficient way to trace, uh, for in, example, river nutrients that are advected and modified by biogeochemical processes. This is an example of the latter one from an article by Lennart and Gross in 2018. Tracing river water from coastal sections around the North Sea, they have estimated first the relative proportion of total nitrogen from these sources, both under present river loads and after an implementation of the water framework directive. And they've also quantified changes in the benthic denitrification after implementation of the water framework directive for five North Sea areas. And again, as a function of changes in river loads from selected coastal areas, and this is hard to monitor, probably not doable at all. Third example, the quality of observations is often uncertain and so are their uh, representativeness. Uh, representation error is probably the most important term in a full analysis of uncertainties and a better understanding of the representation error is the key to more carefully characterize the truth that we seek from the integration of models and observations. There are many sources to representation error, for example, that there is a bias in observations towards calm weather conditions. 
But here I will focus on patchiness, which is of great importance in, for example, zooplankton monitoring. The most common way to sample zooplankton is using nets. This is a VP2 net. It has an opening of uh, a quarter of a square meter. It's normally hauled from 200 meter to surface. And based on the order of 100 such holes, the mean Norwegian sea biomass is estimated every May. Using, a, using an ecosystem model, we have tried to do the same exercise by resampling of the observations in the model zooplankton field. And as you see to the right, uh, the model and observation time series compares pretty well, both on the level and the trend. Then we did a second exercise. The soup, as zooplankton fields are very patchy in both space and time, we resampled the model within a time and space window of 10 days and 50 kilometers. When systematically selecting the maximum and the minimum in these windows, we got these two dotted lines indicating that representativeness for the given sampling pattern might be low due to the patchiness. To the question of which is most important, time or space, they contribute approx approximately equal. Uh, ecosystem models can also contribute to the efficient design and optimization of observing systems. In the zooplankton example, efficient design of the observation observing system using models is probably not possible. But models have been used elsewhere to optimize monitoring programs and design observational networks. I will show you one example from the Norwegian Sea and the standard surveys there to estimate the herring and the mackerel stocks. In this work, a full life cycle model for herring and mackerel, including feeding, growth, and migration, have been coupled to the standard assessment tools used to estimate stock size. But instead of sampling at sea, the standard procedures have been used to sample in the model. The ordinary cruises have been simulated, but in addition, they have been shifted in time, one month early and one month late, and the direction of the cruises have also been changed. Normally it goes from south to north, but we have also done it the other way from north to south. As this is done in the model, we know the correct size of the stock, thus it's easy to quantify the effect of the different cruise designs. This figure is not so easy to read, but I will try to guide you through it, the main findings. We have focused on three different cruises. The first is to the, to the left, that's cruise number A, that's the International Ecosystem Survey in the Nordic Sea. IESNS, uh, that goes in May. And the second one, B, is the, the North Atlantic Spring Spawning Herring Survey, NASSHS, which is in February. And both, both these are primarily targeting the Nor Norwegian Spring Spawning Herring. And then it's the cruise that's uh, in the column D, that is the International Ecosystem Survey, uh, Ecosystem Summer Survey in the Nordic Seas, IESSNS, which is in July and primarily targeting the Northeast uh, Atlantic mackerel. If we focus on the first one, uh, the green, the, 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 the green lines are the correct timing of the cruise. The red is one month early and the blue is one month late. If you can see the triangles, they are for the correct direction going from south to north. And the circles are the opposite direction from north to south. And the conclusion for, from the first cruise, when we do all this late and early and two different correction, is that the estimate is pretty stable, but the uncertainty is large. 
if you go to the next one, we see that if we compare the, 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 the stock level, it's rather robust either way we go, except for a shift in 30 days. So if we do it 30 days later, it will have a large impact. And finally, the, the mackerel cruise, which shows that there is a systematic change in biomass if we reverse the direction of the cruise. Observations are scarce in space and time. And this is probably the oldest argument for models, saying that they can be used to interpolate observations in time and space. I've made an example of numbers and orders just to get an idea about what, is, what this means. So I went into the ISIS database and asked for all CTD stations in the North Sea in 2019. And the number I got was 2,608. And for one year, that sounds like a pretty large number. But if they were equally distributed over the area, there is only one observation per 200 square kilometer. And as the observations are for a whole year, they, rep they represent, of course, a much coarser grid when we also add the time dimension. And if we compare this to the operational services from Copernicus that have outputs every 15 minutes on a three times three kilometer grid, there is a factor one to one million over a year. So can we co then conclude that observations are unnecessary? Of course not. As seen from some of my examples, the problem is not necessarily that there are too many observations, rather the, pro the problem is that there are too few. When that is said, we should also be honest on the fact that there is a great potential for improvement. A lot of things we are doing or uh, we are doing are done just because we have always done it. An old colleague of me once said something like, sometimes when we go to the sea, you get the impression from the planning that you have never been there before. So perhaps it's time to replace some of the old stuff with new programs, perhaps designed using models. With limited resources, the focus should be that if you can't do it properly, you should perhaps consider to spend the money to observe something else. New technology is coming up, up and we should use it. Models are not perfect and they will probably never be, but to improve them, observations both from the field and laboratory are needed as they are essential both for better process understanding and for parameterizations of the models. My first dream for the future is that monitoring programs should be designed with models in mind. Today, the phrase and the observations will be very useful for model validation in most cases are only used to justify extensive operations without really discussing design and appropriateness with the modelers or hosters use. My second dream for the future is a new paradigm for validation. Appreciating all data sources as equal, we should rather start talking about data validation. That means that also observations should be validated before they are used. As we have seen, neither models nor observations represents the truth. Thus, it's more fruitful if the normal would be to use both models and observations together to strengthen both. My third dream for the future is to finally bury Karl Popper, or at least start to use his theory in a more constructive way. Popper was a philosopher born in Vienna in 1902 and died in London in 1994. Among other things, he formulated his basic scientific principle, stating that no theory is completely correct, but if it can be shown both to be falsifi falsifiable and supported with evidence that shows it's true, it can be accepted as true. The consequence of this is that no number of positive outcomes at the level of experimental testing can confirm a scientific, the a scientific theory, but a single counterexample is logically decisive. 
So if we now consider a mechanistic ecosystem model as a scientific hypothesis, this implies that we can never prove it through, never prove it through validation. And no matter how well it performs, users may focus on its mismatches with observations. Because such a model is not representing the full reality, there will always be another observation out there to mismatch, and thereby another confirmation why a model cannot be trusted. Unfortunately, this is still the attitude towards models from manuals. Whereas proper interpretation and the true value of models are often overlooked. On the other hand, one of the main criticisms of Popper's principle is that falsifiability is very strict in its definitions and does not consider the contributions of sciences that are observational and descriptive. The rationale behind this is that in observational research, the experimenter has no control over the composition of the control groups and cannot randomize the allocation of subjects. In addition, the difficulty in isolating what the independent variables are makes it challenging to identify cause and effect relationships. A paradox is therefore that the principle used by many to falsify one theory, in this case, the models, is used in favor of another theory, in this case, observations, that the same principle states as pseudoscience. So perhaps this is a discussion that now should come to an end, realizing that neither models nor observations are the goal but rather see them both as useful data sources. To conclude, both marine e mechanistic ecosystem models and observations are continuously improved in terms of resolution, precision, and accuracy. And tools that are integrating them are being developed. So going forward, it should not be models or observations, but rather models and observations. Using them together generates synergies and allows us to support science better and thereby increase our knowledge and understanding of marine ecosystems to disclose the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morten. That was a really great uh, presentation, and I think it's really um, brought out some of the uh, backwards and forwards that we often have between models and, and uh, observations. So it, it was a, a, a good for you to put it out like that, and, and it would be really interesting to read that paper. Um, so just a reminder for everybody, if you have any questions, please put them in the question and answers. Um, I see there's some already, so I'm going to start... Um, by reading them, and then we'll see how far we get. Um, the first one is by Anne Rowland from AU Denmark. Um, as you clearly explained, both models and observations are only a representation of the truth. Um, we always try to combine both, but of course, there's always limitations. How would you deal with the critics um, that we modelers often experience um, uh, when uh, presenting our work? other than pointing them to your paper, I would say. <laughs> You're muted, so if you answer yeah, you can, to can you, yourself. Can, can, you, can you repeat the, the last part of the question? Sorry. She, basically, the, the crux of the question is, how do you deal with the criticism that modelers often experience when presenting their work? Um, because you, what you've shown here is that, uh, you know, both models and observations yeah. are not truth. No. Personally, I try to deal with, uh, with, uh, with that criticism by turning it a little bit back. That, and I think it's, it's fair to raise the question, so what do the observations represent? Because mm -hmm. I feel that as modelers, we always has, have to defend ourselves. But this miscon uh, misconception that, that observation or truth are never questioned. And if you start to look more into the observations, you, you, will, you will see that, especially this, this issue with representativeness is, is something that is never discussed. So the, the old phrase that if you have an observations that 
that decides everything. Uh, I, uh, I personally, I deny it, and <laughs> I try to raise that uh, the, the the discussion that okay, yeah, I know it's correct, but what does it represent and what does it mean? And mm -hmm. that isn't always so obvious. I guess I guess um, at least in the stock assessment world, they kind of get at it by looking at the catchability of species. So if you have a, cru a cruise and you have a, a survey, you know, some species are more catchable. So you can get some sort of estimate of, of whether your data actually represents the stock size. But indeed, it is something that I think we need to um, point out more uh, to make sure that people are aware that observations aren't necessarily truth. Um, then the next question was by Alessandro uh, Galeo. Um, He's from Marine Scotland Science. He's, he had a comment first to say, um, it's a very good point about model, model va validation um, because generally um, it is considered to be a, 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 what, what model va validation generally is considered to be and what it should actually be. Um, and that that should be taken into account when comparing models and observation da um, observational data. Um, and then his question that came a bit later is, the use of models to inform the representativeness of observations is a good one, but you don't. But you haven't said anything about the effect of how close the model is to the truth, and how that might influence the usefulness of the exercise. No, I think that's a very good point, and and in many cases that is a problem. And but you can you can put a question a little bit back, because if you have a model, how how uh, the, the way to show that the model is the truth, which it is not. And, uh, and if anyone out there are, are, are thinking that I'm saying that the models are the truth, they are wrong. I, I see models as, as a data source uh, among others. And the, the, this, the model validation in fact is, well, you should use the kind of information you have. That observations are, are some of them, it, it goes on so the process understanding and the dynamics in the system. And if you can convince yourself or, and the users that based on all the understanding you have of the, of the system and the processes that the model represents uh, the important pieces of that, then I would say that it's a good representation of the truth. Uh, to compare with the observation is just one part of that exercise. And, and again, as I try to show, yes, you can compare the model and observations uh, uh, point with point, but as the observation uh, do not re really represent anything but that one quarter of a square meter of water, then we, a model with a resolution of 100 kilo, uh, square kilometer in a grid cell is, is not supposed to match that. So in a way you will never get the answer. So it's all these kind of small pieces you should put together and then see if it makes sense. And I think that's model validation. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I have a comment based on that, but I'm going to leave my comment and ask the other questions first. Um, Rad Lars Peters uh, from the Met in Norway said, what about data assimilation? Not really sure I understand the question, but maybe you do. Data assimilation is, um, of course, that, that's a way to get the model closer to the observations. So if that is the goal, then data assimilation is, is a way forward. And mm -hmm. I think that data assimilation has, especially for, for, for physical modeling, has, uh, has improved the quality a lot. But but uh, with uh, biological processes, it's more difficult, again, because uh, we don't have very few observations and, the, and what they really represent are not that obvious as for the physics. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then Myron has a comment um, and he said he'd like to know what you think about it. I don't know if you can read them, but I'll read it out for anybody who can't see. Uh, he says, Myron Peck, he says, another important point is uh, that I try to make is that we now have more than one model and that an ensemble approach helps provide robust evidence for precautionary approaches. Uh, you do not talk about the different types of models, um, i.e. with including structural uncertainty, 
Um, and that I think that this is a strong way forward to help people have confidence in models. So basically mentioning the um, ensemble approach, which we mentioned in our document, by the way. <laughs> yes, and, and I also gave an example of an ensemble, which was a very small ensemble, in fact, but it still was an ensemble on this uh, uh, projection into the future. But of course, ensembles are is a way to reduce uncertainties but because as I said, the models are not a true representation of, uh, of the system. They are, they are just approximations. So if you have many of these with different weaknesses and strengths, you can, you can think that uh, the ensemble will, will do better than, than the independent ones, that they will, will in a way help each other. And that is basically what we also see in the, in the, in the IPCC, that, uh, that they, they uh, have to... Uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, to believe on the I mean on the ensemble, which mm -hmm. which in a way is picking up the strengths and the weaknesses and uh, and giving a more robust uh, message uh, forward. Yeah, indeed. Um, I I'll I'll bring my comment in here because it's related to that. Um, there was a paper by Mike Spence um, on specifically on ensemble approach and and basically your explanation of truth and model outputs and, and observations reminds me of how we kept on trying to explain the, um, the ensemble approach and the Bayesian belief networks that he used in this, in this paper, which uh, is, I think it's called the general framework for combining ecosystem models. And it basically um, is another way to show that if you put a lot of models together, in this case with Bayesian belief networks, then at least you can get maybe possibly closer to the truth if you knew what the truth was. <laughs> um, okay, then uh, our next, I don't know if you want to comment to that. No, I can just comment that I, I, I agree on that. Uh, I think it's the strength in ensembles. And that's also one of the, let's say, the problems with, uh, with ecosystem models that, that in a way they, they are more designed towards a specific uh, application. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, physical models, I mean, the circulation models, I mean, the, as I said, the, the, the primitive equations are the same all over. So you can basically have a, a model for one system and move it to another. To another. Mm -hmm. But for, for uh, ecosystem models, the, the diversity is very big. Mm -hmm. So uh, putting them uh, and running them in the same system, they will have very different strengths and weaknesses. So then uh, mm -hmm. the, the ensemble uh, approach becomes more and more useful, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question is um, from Dina Ipakayin. Oh, sorry, Dina Ipakina. Um, and her question is, what kind of actions do you see in joint planning of monitoring activities taking into account the model, model, modeling requirements? So how do you think should we do it? What, I think what she's trying to get at is what is the actions we need in order to do that? I think that when new... Uh, monitoring programs are planned. You should, I mean, you should bring together the people that 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 would be interested in these observations. And models are one one group, such group. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's and I think that well, it's not obvious that we we'll say the, the best thing is to do a regional uh, cruise. It might be to we we'll say to uh, to have a permanent voice, it might be to repeat one section many times uh, to, to get some more of the dynamics that you, mm -hmm. you, uh, that you would like to, uh, to, to, uh, to use to, uh, for instance, validate the models again. So, uh, I mean, if you do one observation in an area with, with, with a large variability, what, what do you really know? And do you expect a model to, uh, to be used to, to confirm that? or? Or so it's it's a little bit on the purpose, and, um, mm -hmm. and the purpose from the models might be very different from uh, from uh, from the idea of the original cruises. But I think if people sit down together and say, "Well, what do you what do we need?" Then and what would be best for our purposes? Then then I think it would be a, a step forward, and I think it would be useful because mm -hmm. in the in the longer term you will depend on both the observations and the models. So everyone will, in a way, be interested in improving both. Should Thank be. you. <clears throat> yeah. Um, then we have a question by Matthias Renz. 
um, from Kiel University. Um, he says, how do you treat uh, um, uncertainty? Um, where is the uncertainty in the data, the uncertainty in observations, and how do you deal with the uncertainty in the models? Um, do, are there any concepts there? I think that's among the problems that there are no, 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 uh, no standard protocol for, for dealing with uncertainties, neither in, uh, in observations nor in models. And you see that if you, when, when you're comparing models and you get the question of the uncertainty, it, it's very hard to quantify. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that is, that is probably uh, uh, a topic that, that should be more focused on, I mean, how, how to do this. And I have, do not have any simple answer to it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, then we, I'm just trying to get some questions that are from somebody else. Adolf Stips from JRC um, asks, uh, or says, he doesn't agree with your data, uh, with the data assimilation comment. Uh, even in physics, it's helped. It helps only to follow better the observations or getting better initial conditions, but it does not make the model better. Rather, it prevents badly needed improvements on process modeling, um, besides the violation of basic conservation principles when using simple schemes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think I said that uh, uh, data explanation is used to get uh, the model closer to the observations. So uh, I agree with the first part, and I also, uh, in, in, in many ways, agree with the second part of, uh, of, his, uh, of what he said, but uh, I think we leave it there. You guys can have this discussion over a beer when we can have a beer together again sometime. Yeah. <clears throat> um, then we have a question by Robert Thorpe. Um, uh, he says, I used to work in, in, as a cli in climate modeling, and we used to have model intercomparisons of quantities that could not really be measured. So maximum overturning steam stream function, for instance. Uh, if I got a result very different from others, I started to get very nervous, and the temptation to tweak towards the mean was very large. How do we gu guard against group thinking in modeling, and how can observations help with this? Um, and then he's got a follow-up group thinking could reduce the benefits of ensemble approaches if we are not careful. Very valid point, I think. Yeah, it, it, that's a, it's a very valid point. And to avoid group thinking, uh, I think you, <laughs> you have to trust yourself in a way. Uh, but, but of course, when, when do, I've, I've been into several of these uh, model intercomparison studies and it's, it's rather frustrating because you, you're comparing something and I had to admit that models do not disagree. No, 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 sorry, models do disagree. Uh, hmm. And so in a way you end up, uh, I, I recognize the situation, you're ending, oh shit, there is, there is, I've done something wrong because it does not agree with the other ones. And, um, and there is not necessarily a, a, an answer, yes or no to, to, uh, to that. But of course, in some, in some cases, you realize that there is a bug in your model when you see the other ones. But on the other hand, as I said, there are strengths and weaknesses and the designs are different. So they are not, uh, they are not supposed to, to be equal either. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it goes down to the fund, fundamental thing, uh, how, how you constructed it and, uh, and and if they are, are different, they will be different. We, we had a publication last year, uh, also originated from this, this ISIS working group. Uh, first author was Marie Mar in, in Denmark, where we, we were changing the, uh, the, uh, the mortality terms uh, in, uh, in, uh, in plankton models. And it was interesting to see how the, the, the cascading effects, how they differ between the different models. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and the, uh, the main answer to that, that was that, well, they, was, they were constructed differently. I mean, the number of species and the number on each mm -hmm. level was different. So the cascading effects became, became different. Mm -hmm. Even if, in, in a way, you would say that they were supposed to behave the same. And, there was no obvious answer to which one was correct or not because we couldn't observe this. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay, so then uh, we have another question. Uh, we have a question here from Medith. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Morathi, um, from Marine Scotland Science again. 
Uh, she says, she, he says, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, do you think simulation studies have value in allowing us to validate models and move towards truth? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick answer. <laughs> that's a quick answer. Yeah, I think, I think that, that's, I mean, that, it's a, that's a part of science. I mean, I, I see model as a, models as a part of science. I see models as, as a data source. So mm -hmm. to run simulation models, you will learn more about the system. You will, I mean, you, it's, it's a way to integrate, integrate your process understanding and see mm -hmm. how it makes sense. And well, you can, to put it the other way, uh, it, it's a way to, to, to stress test your conceptual understanding of the system. I mean, there might be inconsistencies in how we think uh, the situation behaves. And when you put it together in the model, it could either be, be, uh, be a confirmation of that, what, what you think is the, the process or how, how the ecosystem functioning are. If it could be a confirmation on that is true, or it could be the opposite saying, well, if that is true, there are some dramatic consequences here that we do not observe. So there is something that we do not understand yet. So yes, I think it's, it, it's a good way to, uh, to move forward to the truth. Thank you, Morten. Um, I think you can stop sharing your screen if you don't mind, but I have a few more comments. Uh, one more from Alessandro Gala Gallego saying um, about data assimilation, it can also be claimed that it is a fiddle to get around shortcomings in the model. I don't know if you want to comment to that. Um, and um, Myron um, came back with, uh, I don't know if what the, this was a comment based on something. Um, he said, or it just shows the variation, various estimates from different models uh, for a weight of evidence approach. It doesn't mean that they are right. Um, and then he also made a comment, but many models has the same grandmother or grandfather. Um, so agreements may well come from the similar construction and assumptions. So making modules um, like physics, physical or biological that can be interchanged and examined, uh, examining estimates is a very interesting approach. Um, and I, I said that you had mentioned that already. So I don't know if you want to answer to any of those comments. No, if there was something else, then uh, we could go forward. I think those. I think those are all the comments that I've had, um, and I think we've reached the the end of our um, hour or nearly there. Um, so I think all that's left for me is to thank you very much and to say to people to remind people that. Um, they can uh, download this web uh, this webinar from from our YouTube channel if you want to go back and hopefully um, the the paper maybe you can give us a link to the paper we can also put it there so people can can get a copy of it there or at least get the the reference for it there um, so thank you very much Morton it was great it was good good to talk about um, very intense uh, modeling questions <laughs> um, here. Um, and I will uh, finish off by saying um, thank you all for participating. I think I saw that we had more than 100 people. It must be our most people on a webinar um, yet um, at one stage. And to say that our next um, webinar is on uh, Thursday, the 18th of March. And we will talk uh, to our young ambassadors, which are just, we have um, young ambassadors at the Marine Board and, and Alba Gonzalez and Liam Lux are our first two young ambassadors that are just um, finishing their term with us and they are going to give us um, some uh, some background to the their actual research and their um, career perspectives um, as being part of, of the young ambassador program so um, i hope to see you all next uh, month on the third thursday of the month 18th of march and thank you again morton it was great